Hello, good morning, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining another TAUS webinar. My name is Anamai van der Meer. I'll be your host today again. Um, last month, for those of you who joined us, we had some of our NLP experts walk you through the cleaning steps that are involved when it comes to getting high quality empty training data. Um, at TAUS, and we explained this last time as well, and you probably know this of us, but we've been on a data journey for a long time advocating for the adoption of machine translation from the very beginning. And so today my colleagues will talk about how you can optimize your training data and how you evaluate training data. And we've also invited two users of TAUS data to share some insights on their training experiments. Um, and of course, we'll leave enough time at the end for a Q&A. So thanks for joining and welcome. Uh, let me introduce you to the speakers for today. Uh, we're excited to have Jörn Gutker from Lilt joining us. You see him here on the screen. And we have JP Parazza from Sistron as well. Um, and of course, my colleagues from the data team, David Coates and Milos Milovanovic. Um, so um, yeah, we can have a look at the agenda. I don't know who is controlling the slides. Yeah, so I walked through it a little bit already at the beginning, of course. I, I, we've gone through the introductions. Uh, Milos will start with explaining the journey that we have done from Taos that we're still on. Uh, when it comes to data, we'll talk to you about the importance of data, how you can optimize your training data. Then we'll have two use cases, as I explained, one from Lilt and one from Sistron. Uh, we'll touch briefly on where you can find training data and then um, we'll do our Q&A. So if you have any questions, um, either for Milos David or for Jörn or JP, write them in the chat box and we'll have plenty of time at the end to go through them. So that said, I think the floor is yours, uh, Milos. Uh, Milos, we cannot hear you. I think you're muted still. Hello, I hope everybody can hear me now. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, so first of all, thanks for a nice intro and thank you everybody for joining us today. Uh, I'll be quickly talking about Tao's data journey and uh, where we are now, why the data is important. Uh, so as most of you know, in 2008, Tao started the data cloud as an industry shared repository. Uh, this was the, the first big uh, industry a data sharing uh, platform uh, and as the data cloud has been growing to 1.75 billion words we have been growing with the services that have been built around the data cloud um, one of the most important services we did in 2000 we created in 2018 is the matching data that is a cluster search uh, technology used to find the uh, domain-specific segments out of all a data-specific language pair. And then uh, in 2019, we started a human language project, the HOP platform and the controlled crowd communities, where we wanted to promote the importance of uh, low resource languages. So low resource languages are languages spoken by uh, huge communities, but these languages are fortunately poorly available online. And we wanted uh, to, to change this with uh, our HOP project where we create uh, data sets for these low resource languages that are used to train the machine translation engines. And last year, in November, uh, we launched our Taos Data Marketplace that is a platform for buying and selling, uh, for acquiring and monetizing uh, language data. So here we have everything in, in a nutshell. Uh, the data marketplace, just a quick overview of a few services that are coming in as integrated solutions. So currently, as it's been launched in November, we are constantly optimizing and adding the new features. So currently, we are working on optimizing a buyer's flow. Uh, we're also working on anonymization. And uh, well, personally, for me, the coolest thing is the matching data that will be integrated uh, in June or uh, July. Uh, this year where basically uh, buyers will have a possibility to upload the sample data and then uh, the algorithm will automatically uh, generate the output data set that uh, reflects uh, their, their sample. So this will be fully automated process. Currently this 
matching data uh, technology and service uh, runs uh, manually. And uh, uh, what I wanted to add here is that uh, also in last webinar, we were talking a lot about the data services uh, that we now offer as, um, as a 10 step uh, solution where we prepare the data of our client, clean it, anonymize it, tune it, and reach. Uh, the data all depending on the specific needs of our clients and um, yeah a few more points about the data library so whenever the data set is created with the matching data service <laughs> the specific data set is published in um, Tao's data library so these are of the shelves uh, of the shelf data sets that are ready made and available for immediate download and they can be uh, push through machine translation engines immediately. Uh, what we see in the recent months and, and uh, during last year is that there is a big demand for e-commerce data. So just to share a bit of information there, we have immediately available data sets uh, with the languages listed in the left box and uh, the languages that are coming uh, this week actually that are in the production for e-commerce are in the right box. So they will be published in the data library uh, quite soon. So e-commerce is one of the domains that's been uh, quite important uh, in the last uh, year next to the healthcare, of course. And I wanted to share uh, this uh, piece of information with, uh, with the audience. Um, why the data is important? Uh, data, we are using the quote that uh, more data outperforms a smart model but the better data outperforms more data. So uh, we are advocating the importance of data uh, since 2008. Uh, we advocate the importance of uh, high quality domain specific, especially with NLP. Uh, th th this data is, is really relevant for customization of the models. Later, uh, JP and Jörn will talk about it. And here you have a piece of information that is actually coming from the Gartner report, where by 2025, 10% uh, of global enterprises will have some uh, hub integrated, the translation hub integrated uh, in their operation. 70% uh, of the translators will actually be focusing on the review of um, empty output. 50% uh, of, uh, of enterprises will use uh, per word, uh, per, per hour uh, rates instead of uh, per word rates. And this is something we have been uh, talking a lot, we have been talking a lot in the last years, also with our uh, DQF uh, dashboard where we measure time uh, that is uh, used to do some review. And uh, we, well, Gartner estimates uh, that the enterprises uh, who don't follow these uh, optimizations, uh, they, they will also fail to optimize their translation model. So where the data comes in is that for to build this uh, integrated hubs, the domain-specific data is needed. And of course, if there is not enough data for specific language, DAOs can help there. Uh, if uh, the enterprises will be looking to expand in the languages that are uh, not covered, DAOs will be there to support. And from a translator's perspective, in order to have optimized the review flow, the review of uh, the machine translation output, uh, DAOs will be there also to help uh, by providing domain-specific data sets uh, to have a, a good models that will not need uh, a lot of review, making the review uh, process quite efficient. And with this, I will give a microphone to my colleague, David. David, the floor is yours and you can control the slide now. Thank you. Okay, yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Milos. Um, yeah, the, you already actually uh, said it. Uh, uh, more data performs, uh, outperforms uh, smart model. Um, and I will, uh, Talk a bit, a bit more about also the, the more data, uh, better data, and the quality. I will, I will uh, in, the, in the coming section of this uh, of this webinar, I will be talking about the matching data, and uh, you can read the slide <laughs> about the matching data process at uh, at Taos. 
and how you can best uh, work with uh, query Kerber because uh, maybe you're interested in to uh, to build your own query and you to build your training data um, Taos provides the uh, the training data for your uh, for your machine translation uh, and um, well I'll, I'll be talking about how to optimize your query uh, to use for your for your training data so my name is uh, David Code. I'm part of uh, the data team here at, uh, at Taos. Um, and uh, well, we already talked about better, uh, more data is outperforms the, the, the smart models. Um, that was certainly true for the time when uh, statistical machine translations was uh, very important. Uh, there was uh, a lot of data needed and um, well, that, that should be of course good data but uh if there was some 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 noise in that that wasn't too bad uh as long as the good data was outnumbering the bad data but actually in the time of neural machine translation that that kind of kind of changed uh there is uh, more need of, of high quality data a more need of, uh, of 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 very relevant data so um what you can do with uh, with data is, uh, is is much more. You don't need so much data for the for the neural machine translation, but it's it's just more uh, picky. So better quality and higher uh, better relevance. Um, now, um, this sort of illustrates the uh, the journey at uh, at Taos, how we went from the data cloud to the matching data process and then uh, we'll be continuing that in the data marketplace the old data cloud was really document based so uh, users could could uh, uh, upload complete documents and they tagged it with uh, with the domain say it's uh, pharmaceutical information it's software etc uh, and then uh, this tag was as an umbrella for the for the complete uh, for the complete document now uh, later on we we realized that uh actually tagging this this document uh there's there's pieces in each document that are that are quite uh, good together that is that has more uh that 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 can be that can be combined instead of taking the whole document and i would like to um sort of made the analogy with uh, how, how music nowadays is uh, consumed uh, back in the old days you you when you wanted to have music you want to buy music you went to the um, to the record store and you had this artist in mind and you went to uh, buy a complete cd or a complete album of this uh, of this artist nowadays with uh, music uh, streaming services that that of course, has all been changed. Of course, you can still buy albums, but um, I don't know. I've, I've I've got this habit. Like on uh, Monday morning, I go to Spotify. I'm uh, opening it up, and I see uh, a list, a playlist that is specially personalized for uh, for for me. I can uh, start listening to it. I see a lot of songs that I, I've never heard of before, uh, but this. This list is specially made for me, and, uh, and it's, it's actually quite spot on. I, I, I often very much like it. Now, that is a sort of uh, analogy of uh, what matching data is actually like. Um, and um, then we are really into uh, the, the, the matching data process. Now, uh, to take this analogy again, uh, what's this list is based on this. This uh, Spotify list is based on is on on my old listening uh, habits. So it has this uh, this algorithm that that uh, that knows what what I what I like based on my history of uh, of, of use of, of Spotify. And that is sort of the que the, the the query corpus of Spotify. And we have this sort of the same with matching data. Uh, if you are looking for training data in this in this in this big uh, repository of Taos, you can get the right data out of it with uh, Query Corp. So a Query Corp is, is just a, a big text file with those segments that are relevant for your training, 
uh, with this uh, with this uh, query corpus, we can sort out out of uh, out of our repository of uh, of Taos data all those uh, segments that can be good for for the training. But of course, uh, the bigger this this query corpus, uh, the better because we 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 got to know the, the the thing that we are searching for. So what is what is exactly what is the right size of a of a query corpus? Uh, and um, we have as a as a rule of thumb that uh, if if people are looking uh, for data and they come up with a query corpus of, of roughly say twenty thousand segments. That is that is good enough for us to to go inside a repository and, uh, and get those chunks of data out of it that are relevant for for the, for the training. Now this is of course is a, a rule of thumb. Um, it could be less. It could be more. Uh, it all depends a bit on uh, all kind of other factors. Uh, it should be uh, a, a nice clean uh, query corpus. Uh, could also maybe 10,000 could also be suffice, but uh, as a rule of thumb, we have 20,000. Um, many people will look into their old uh, data, old projects, translation projects, and they might have a choice like uh, to send us monolingual or bilingual files. So let's say you are looking for uh, training data that goes from English to, to French. And you can come up with a monolingual data sets, but you also have already from previous uh, translation projects, you have bilingual data. Now that could be very useful for us as well. Um, think of, um, think of a, a query corpus that has a, a lot of the, the English word uh, rate in it. Uh, rate is, is, is quite, uh, well, uh, it's, it's, it's can stand for a lot of things. Uh, if if the French counterpart of rate has uh, words like uh, vitesse or uh, fréquence, uh, I'm hoping you you get the gist of the of the French. Uh, then probably the the the, the, the corpus that you're looking for is more technical uh, in nature. Whereas as uh, for example, you have a lot of uh, tarif uh, in French. Then probably rate is, is meant to be more uh, a financial term, and, and well, so you, I guess that's that that makes it clear why bilingual data can be very useful in in getting a better uh, selection of our data. Another thing is your query corpus should be very focused. You should be using a very specific subject, which is uh, I think that's 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 very important. Um, I can give you um, uh, an example from uh, a request that we that we had was about uh, computer gaming, and uh, this computer game was about sports. Uh, so we were asked to supply uh, a, a, a training data about computer gaming, especially sports. But the query corps that we got also had a lot of uh, the. Uh, the credit section. So they send us all data from all projects, and in this data there was also like the, the credits for a game. So uh, who is the, the the lead developer? Who is the uh, graphical designer, etc. And because of this, uh, all these credits that were also in the, in the query corpus, it uh, it pushed away the, the the real subject of the query corpus, and um, it also made the thing that it it uh, that was all about made it a little bit more diffuse and hard to uh, uh, hard to get the real things out. Another thing is that um, the the query corpus should be clean. Of course, it saves us all a lot of work if uh, if the file format is, is right. Uh, if there's uh, the tags are uh, there's no formatting tags etc. Uh, there's no line breaks in between the, the sentences etc. That's I think that's that's those are the four main points of of setting up an ideal query corpus. And with this we can uh, start working and I'll, I'll I'll briefly go through the different steps in the uh, in the workflow here. Uh, at the first request, we can get a first estimation on 
uh, whether it's uh, whether this this subject, this domain, and this language combination that's requested uh, is is in our repository. So we we sort of have an idea what 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 there is. There's billions of words, but we can make a good estimation of uh, of its if it's worth our, our time uh, in investigating it. Then the second part is the actual data district uh, extraction. So uh, right now we are. Uh, starting up a supervised process, so uh, someone is, is really uh, starting this, this scripts, is looking through the results of it, uh, and uh, estimates whether or not this uh, this is a good uh, training corpus. Uh, usually, we uh, we supply with uh, with three sizes of the data. So we have a small corpus which is very relevant uh, with all, only relevant uh, segments we've got a little bit uh, bigger corpus which has also less relevant segments and then the huge one the the, the big one that is uh, that's of course uh, has the most least uh, segments with less relevance but is also quite big together with this uh, we supply some uh, some samples and accounts of the of the size of the corpora, and the samples is there for the feedback. So you can always give feedback on what you think of uh, this query corp, of this uh, this training data corpus. Um, and we love to hear whether the the quality is good. If we picked out the right relevant things uh, and. Uh, that there's there can be some some fine tuning even more after this process. The algorithms that we use are based on, uh, on words, uh, and uh, we try to uh, we we get more and more uh, word embeddings in our, our processing. So uh, the selection is, is first on words, and then later we are filtering on uh, the word embeddings. Uh, uh, but we are getting uh, more and more, using more and more the word embeddings also in our selection process. Uh, okay, so the, um, then, so you get the, uh, the training data and how should you look at these? How can you evaluate these, uh, this, these data? Um, of course, you need to realize that training data is different from actual translations. The end user will probably not see whatever there is in the, in the training data. So it's good to realize that you, whenever you're looking, when you try to estimate your, your, uh, your data, you are uh, looking at two other things than, than just the translation. You're looking at the relevance of the, of the training data and the quality and the relevance well, let's let's uh, have a look. Uh, I'm I'm picking out a small sample of whenever I'm uh, looking at the training data. I'm taking out a small sample, and I'm going through it segment by segment. And uh, whenever there's ninety percent of the segments that are really relevant to the subject, I'm, I'm I think it's it's good. The quality is uh, is important, but specifically on the on the accuracy of the data so I'm, I'm using here the QF uh, error types uh, the data should be accurate in the sense that uh, the the translation is, is covering what is in the source text and I'm, I'm using their other external machine translation and see whether these uh, translations are, are accurate of course, it should also be according to linguistic uh, conventions. So, in my in the samples that I use, I'm also looking at at the grammar if uh, sentences are not cut off, uh, and uh, if if it has the right encoding. The data that we have usually come from uh, from different sources, so we do have to care about whether the encoding is correct, if it has all the all the right uh, character types, etc. And with that, uh, I do my uh, quality assurance uh, stuff like uh, um, style is. I think that's that's less important. Style is uh, something that you uh, during the, the post editing process will probably be uh, be working on. But for the training data, that is 
that is hard to hard to control, of course. Okay, that's my part of the um, of the training data um, generation, and now the word is on uh, Jan. Jan, can you come in? Hello. Um, yeah, and I'm going to share my screen. Let's hope that you can see it. Can you? Yes. Can you also see me? I'm not entirely sure about this. Not here. Yeah. Oh, yeah, now you can. There you go. Yeah. Um, all right, thanks for the introduction. Um, so I'm going to present how uh, the data we obtained from Taos impacted um, our interactive adaptive neural machine translation system um, at LILT. And in order to uh, understand that or describe that, uh, I'm going to start by giving you a better idea of what LILT actually is. Um, so at LILT, we are um, providing language and uh, localization services to global enterprises. And we do that uh, through our unique human-powered technology-assisted um, workflow, which you can see here. Um, and at the heart of this workflow is um, the human linguist, right? So that means all of our translations are still produced by humans, but they are being made more effective um, by the technology. Um, and the technology um, in itself works, um, like in the beginning, it, uh, or at, at the basis of this technology, we still have uh, a standard neural machine translation engine, which, um, which is powered by lots of parallel translation data. Um, but there are two unique components, um, which are specific to the human in the loop artificial intelligence setup. Um, and I'm going to uh, describe these two components separately. One is what I call the, the horizontal component. Um, and that is basically the human linguist and the machine translation, translation system collaborating to produce the translation for a single sentence and for every single sentence, right? So um, in, like as opposed to um, machine translation post-editing, where the, the linguist is just presented with, uh, with a translation suggestion and then edits that to, to um, obtain the, the final translation. Uh, this is, this is a, more of a collaboration where the human is presented with, um, with a translation suggestion for the full sentence. Then they have the, the possibility to accept a number of words that have been suggested and then type something new. Um, and whatever the, the linguist types then gets sent back to the MT system um, which then updates its suggestions for the remainder of the sentence based on what the linguist has typed. And this is this is a back and forth that goes on um, so until the final translation has been produced collaboratively. So again, so this is the, the horizontal part of, or the horizontal component of our human in the loop um, workflow. The vertical component is, um, what we call the adaptivity. Um, that means from, ev from every single sentence um, the, the translator produces and finishes, our machine translation engine learns, um, and that means it improves uh, the suggestions being made from one sentence to the next. Because every time a sentence is being, being translated, it already has incorporated the knowledge it has gained from all previous sentences um, that have been translated by, by the by the translator in, in the specific document or project. Um, right, so these uh, are the important components. Um, so how do we measure the final translation quality? Um, obviously, we are using um, the, the blue score, uh, which is uh, very common for machine trans translation quality evaluation, um, but it measures full sentence translation quality. Now, if you recall, the, we had this um, human in the loop workflow where we uh, collaborative, co collaboratively produce the translation between the machine and the translator. And this is better measured by the word prediction accuracy. Right? So it measures the percentage of words that are correctly predicted um, in this interactive um, workflow, in this collaborative work workflow between um, the translator and the machine. And that basically means you can interpret it as the helpfulness of the system to the translator, because it's the percentage of words 
that the user or the translator does not have to type or come up with by themselves, but instead it's being suggested by the, by the machine. And then again, both of these metrics can be measured in a static um, way, which corresponds to uh, the way you would measure it for, for um, uh, a standard neural machine translation system that you can uh, that you have API uh, access to for the, uh, on the internet or in the adaptive mode, which is what I called as uh, which I which I described as the um, vertical um, component of our human in the loop workflow, where from ev every single sentence um, the translator works on the neural machine translation engine updates its um, uh, personalized um yeah the personalized engine that is that is specific to the user and therefore uh, can improve all um suggestions from one sentence to the next right so um last year we we um obtained uh english korean uh, parallel data from taos um and i'm going to show you how this actually impacted our translation engines. So you can see um, the data statistics. Um, so after uh, after we had um, cleaned and and kind of customized the data we obtained from Taos with uh, with their help, um, basically it uh, more or less doubled uh, uh, the, the size of our training data um, in number in terms of number of segments. Um, it's slightly more than doubled it in terms of number of words as you can see the numbers here um and these are the final results so let's uh dive through these these numbers a bit first of all um i'm evaluating um two different domains one is the general domain which is represented by the iwslt data set here this is um data that is extracted from ted talks um and we are evaluating on the technical domain, which is uh, on, in this case on um, on our internal user data sets uh, for the domains of tech support and tech marketing. Um, so large parts of the, the data we obtained from Taos is on the, in the technical domain, which is it is expected to have explicit uh, impact on this domain. Um, then again, we are measuring both blue and word prediction accuracy. Um, blue basically represents the, the full sentence quality, whereas WPA, uh, word prediction accuracy, represents the quality uh, for the um, horizontal component of our human in the loop artificial intelligence um, workflow. Um, and then finally, there are these two tables. They're static at the top and adaptive at the bottom. And this again, uh, represents um, uh, our vertical human in the loop workflow component, uh, namely the bottom um, table uh, uses our adaptive workflow where the system learns from one sentence to the next. Right, so if you look at these results, um, let's first look at the, the, the general domain. As I said, most of the, the data that uh, we obtained from Taos was on the technical domain, so we didn't expect to see much of a difference there, and that is basically what happened, and that's a good sign. Um, sometimes it's possible that, that very specific data um, can hurt performance on uh, general domain systems, um, so this is that it didn't do that um, it's, is a very good sign. But on the other hand, when it can, uh, comes to performance on our user-specific uh, technical data sets, we can see large gains from adding um, the data we obtained from Taos. And in the static um, case, you can see here that, it, that the blue gains are between 8.3 and 9.1 um, blue points, which is quite a large jump. Um, and the, another good news is that this, um, this gain still carries over to the to the adaptive use case. So even even after having been able to learn from uh, well from the user data itself, um, the the head start the system received from from being presented with this additional data still um, carries over into the final translation scores. 
Um, and now the final, the most interesting part for, from my point of view are the word prediction accuracy scores in the adaptive case, because these really represent the helpfulness of the, uh, of the machine translation system for our linguists. Right? And the interesting bit there is also compared to the static um, uh, case, the, the gains we obtain from the TELS data are slightly diminished, but really not that much. And we still obtain a really, really good improvement over um, the baseline we had uh, running in production before we before we obtained that data. And let's let's have a quick look uh, at an example here um, for the technical support um, data, the word prediction accuracy in the adaptive case um, improved from 57.2% to 66.8%. Now, what, what exactly does that mean? Um, so before we, we uh, leverage the task data, we that basically means that the user, the translator had to type um, 42.8% of the words. So out of 100 words, they would have had to type roughly 43 words um, and the rest would have been suggested by the system. Now, with the TAUS data, the accuracy improved to 66.8% and that means roughly out of 100 words, the translator would have had to come up and type uh, only 33 words, right? So, that, so it moved from having to type 40, 43 words to 33 words. That's an improvement of nearly one quarter of the uh, of number of words that the user, uh, the translator has to come up with by themselves. And I think this is um, a very um, very good impact that, this, that the system and the data has on, on our human translators. All right, um, there will be a joint Q&A &A session at the end. So I will hand over to John Paul. Thank you so much, uh, Jörn. Uh, JP, indeed, uh, it's time for your slides and I'll make my colleague Miloš presenter again who will be sharing on your behalf. Yes, thank you. And can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you well. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yes, so Milos will present on my behalf. I had some technical issues this morning, so I don't have all my data slides, but I will cover the data. I have my notes. Um, so yeah, so SysTran is uh, one of the original machine translation providers. We've been doing machine translation uh, since the dark ages of machine translation back and started in the 1950s. Uh, but of course now everything is uh, neural machine translation based. And we also, if you can go to the next slide, uh, just to give an overview of where we are currently in, the, in our state of affairs. And of course, no need to read the detail of the slide, but we've created a SysTran marketplace. Uh, uh, we have a, uh, a software stack, uh, which is described on the left side, which includes SaaS-based products, um, which uh, we uh, have named SysTran Translate and variations of that, whether it's uh, consumption by API or professional use consumption, all the way up to our enterprise uh, system for on-premise or hosted uh, private cloud um, secure environments, which, we, which is named SysTran Pure Neural Server. Um, in this marketplace, we have a couple of components that really make up the important parts of uh, making machine translation adaptive and, you know, best use case for your prof your professional use, uh, whether that's in a human in the loop localization workflow or whether it's in a direct to consumer uh, raw machine translation output from a customized uh, machine translation system. So we have the SysTran uh, technology at the core of it. Uh, we've built a product named SysTran Model Studio that enables uh, customization, uh, specialization in our terminology of the neural machine translation to your specific domain or use case. Uh, in the marketplace, we have what we call data providers uh, and or trainers. These are the, uh, the specific industry, specific language specialists that are able to customize and specialize neural machine translation for industry specific verticals or uh, sub-domains, sub-genres within a language um, that are highly specific for different use cases. Uh, there are a large amount of neural machine translation models that we've made available through our marketplace. 
uh, that are either built by SysTran or built by our marketplace uh, community of trainers and providers. And this is um, this, this connection here with data providers and, and trainers is really where we fit in with the Taos data marketplace. Um, so this is where Taos' Taos data it has helped us enhance the uh, capabilities of machine translation systems for specific use cases. Uh, and if, Milos, if you would um, go to the next slide, I'm going to um, briefly cover three different use cases in which we've used Taos data. We've used Taos data marketplace now for a number of, ca of use cases. I just wanted to cover a few here. Um, and we've seen great results, and of course, I'd love to share those with you now. So the first um, customer use case that I wanted to discuss was a, is a customer in the uh, retailer commerce industry. Um, so when we first engaged with this customer, uh, the customer had been doing uh, traditional human localization for quite some time and had a lot of translation memories of their own that they wanted to use to build uh, their customized mach machine translation systems. We initially did a proof of concept for them to show them the power of not only the SysTran platform, but also of the ability to enhance uh, the data that they had with that data coming from the Taos data marketplace. So in that particular use case, the customer had uh, roughly around 3 million translation units of their own, so 3 million sentences uh, of data, bilingual data. And we enhanced that with the Taos data by sending Taos team a sample corpora, uh, Milos uh, uh, and David uh, described the use of the sample corpora for their matching data service earlier. And uh, the results uh, came back uh, from Taos with a matching data corpora uh, of around uh, 250,000, 280,000 segments that really sort of narrowed down the, the, the use case for this particular customer in the English to Spanish uh, language pairing. Um, without going into all of the data uh, details, which I did have in my data, my data table, which isn't available to me now, uh, we have scored a baseline system, a baseline generic system for this customer uh, at around uh, 28 and a half blue, 28.5 blue. We also do human evaluations for all of these projects, but uh, I'm just going to cover the automated metrics for this for, for this brief discussion. Uh, we then enhanced the, tra the translation model with the Taos matching data. And we ran around 15 to 20 epics of training. And each epic of training is basically where the system is fed the data and uh, in random samplings, random mixes of data, and is then using that data to enhance the neural machine translation model, so to learn from that data. And we run the data uh, over many cycles to keep the sort of um, the reinforcement of that learning going. Um, the results for this particular use case were uh, already uh, more than seven blue increase um, and also very importantly uh, matching the uh, the style of output so the fluid style of output that the customer was wanting for this particular use case which was a more formal formal version of Spanish so these are things again that you can control during the specialization process which really enhanced then the use case afterwards, whether that use case afterwards with the model is going to be uh, a human in the loop post editing workflow, or if it's gonna be direct to customer translations of content on, on, their, on their sites, on their web properties, or for their support. The second use case that I wanna just quickly describe then is uh, the, an automotive use case. So this is automotive industry. Uh, we have uh, a number of, uh, of, of, of customers that are in this space, and we wanted to enhance the English-German offering uh, for this particular industri industry domain. And this is both directions, English to German, German to English. Um, so what we got is we already had a good generic baseline of our own system making. And what we do is we then gave a, a sample corporate to Taos. Taos gave us, um, returned to us about 555,000 sentences of uh, English to German data in the automotive industry space, uh, according to the sample cluster. Uh, of course, in our, part, in our part of our ingestion process, and I won't go into details, I know that they were, it was described in the previous webinar, we also do um, our own data cleanup and ingestion process. Of course, there's uh, different things uh, that are done to get the system, get the data into a particular training system. Uh, so we have our own at SysTrend. Um, but what we had in the results were very positive. So we had uh, um, 
uh, an increase of more than five blue on the English to German direction and an increase of more than six blue on the German to English uh, direction. Uh, the baseline scores were already quite high for these, uh, for these models. Um, they're built with our big transformer algorithm. And so these, uh, these improvements were quite uh, impressive for us in the use case and the human evaluations that we conducted thereafter also uh, described this, uh, this particular improvement in accuracy and fluency. Um, one more use case that I want to describe before uh, finalizing here the, the, the brief description uh, back with the original customer is the customer use case of the healthcare or COVID-19 pandemic. So last year, Taos um, uh, launched an initiative which, in which we participated for Corona Crisis Corpora. We, uh, they released uh, six language pairs uh, of data, so six languages of data from the Taos team. It consisted of more than 3.4 million TUs across the six language pairs. We conducted a Cistrana training for each one of those language pairs. Um, each one of those trainings uh, was done for approximately 20 epics of training. Uh, and we had some really great results, uh, which Taos published recently in, the, in a case study. And uh, we saw an average of more than 18% blue across all six language pairs, which was great. Of course, some language pairs had higher increases while whilst others had uh, maybe a more minor increase depending on the language pairing itself. And in addition to that, our human evaluations of those uh, improvements of those models also showed that there was an improvement in accuracy and fluency and of course the terminology selected uh, based on the TAUS matching data. So that's, what, which, that's the thing that's actually very uh, useful with this case. So, um, just to just to round out, uh, just want to say that customer case one, um, you know, was impressed with the results that we did, and we then eventually did uh, more of their languages uh, using Taos matching data. Most recently, we used a twenty thousand TU sample corpora from this customer to to enhance the English to German for their use case uh, in marketing. We received a close to three hundred thousand TUs from the Taos team from the Taos uh, data marketplace. Um, and this is a human in the loop uh, localization workflow use case. Uh, the production system is scoring um, greater than 75 blue points with the, hum uh, with the translation memories from the customer also being used on the fly, thanks to not only the specialization training we're able to do, but also by enhancing that translation model with SysTrends. Uh, neural fuzzy adaptation TM technology, which is a new technology we use to be able to use new uh, uh, translation memories on the fly with a specialized machine translation model. So with that being said, I will cede any additional time so we can open up the questions and answers, um, of course, in this webinar portion and make it more interactive. So thank you. Thank you, JP. Um, so yeah, with that, we are ready for our, our Q&A. So I'd like to ask all the um, presenters to come back to the, uh, to the, to the stage, <laughs> our virtual stage, uh, and um, yeah, the audience to submit any questions if you, if you have any questions, of course. Um, one question that did already come up is, of course, um, uh, the question if, if you don't have enough data in a certain domain or a certain language, um, and it's also not available on the Taos data marketplace, what what can we do? Um, or actually, um, I'm moving too fast, Milos. It's time first for you to to tell people where we can find language data, right? We... Yes. Can you hear yeah. me? Yes, I can hear you. Uh, yes, yeah, so before uh, going to questions and answers, uh, we just had one slide on how to interact and how to engage with DAOs, so this will be just a quick one. So obviously, the, the for occasional buyers, uh, pay-as-you-go is the easiest option. Uh, then we have our membership plans that this year have been changed to the packages where you get a bundle of uh, data credits, uh, events, uh, that can be used uh, for um, different data sets and for different events. And uh, eventually we have try before you buy uh, option that we also introduced this year where uh, there is a possibility uh, to train your models with the data 
and then uh, acquire uh, data if uh, they meet uh, some results. This is for uh, large data volume users. So with this, um, we can go to questions and, and answers. Great, thanks. Um, so yeah, one question here, I'll come back to the other question later, um, but there's a question here on when you're measuring quality of the training data, um, you only take into account the encoding and not the decoding. Why is that? I don't know who wants to answer that question. <laughs> well, the thing was that uh, the um, uh, character encodings is, is what uh, what is what is mattering here. So um, it's more that we we look at into our data and we we try to spot uh, the and the, the difficulties with uh, with the data. There are several points where uh, stuff needs to be uh, repaired, and the, uh, that is what we are looking for. While we are um, controlling our, our uh, the, the quality of our data we are looking to those things that go wrong and uh, so there's <clears throat> for example if we if we see weird uh, strange garbage uh, characters we want to to get them out uh, and that is uh, that is what the thing that we are looking for and while we are um, getting feedback on those kind of errors in our uh, in our repositories we we also we Get that into into a loop. Uh, we are uh, working on on um, different different methods how to uh, filter out data, the good data, uh, and also repair data. And um, this uh, this feedback that we get from customers is also part of of that uh, feedback loop all the time. We are uh, going back to uh, to the data, repairing it. Uh, sending it out to the customer, getting feedback, and so and so on and on. So that's that's how it works. So this encoding is really about uh, the um, the errors in the in the, the data, just uh, just just garbage characters. Thanks, David. Um, the other question that I started to ask before we were actually done with the the webinar is. Um, um, if you don't have enough data in a certain domain, a certain language, uh, where can you, or what can, how can Taos help to to get that data? Um, Milos, that's probably a good question for you. Yes, yes. So um, basically, we can uh, perform a matching data with an English sample. So if uh, if a company is looking to expand in some uh, language pairs that they don't have any data available we can uh, use the monolingual english data set uh, to perform a query and deliver uh, parallel data in the english and target language pair uh, yeah this is the the most common use case so and we also have off the shelf data in our data library we have data, data marketplace so there is uh, plenty of possibilities with us of course you can reach us out and uh, then we can uh, discuss this uh, possibility in, in more detail just to understand what it's that uh, the need is and of course we have the the opportunity to create data sets right with our hlp community uh yes yes this is this is correct so uh, we also have the possibility to create data set uh from scratch uh because we can create a monolingual uh, source text from our repositories and uh, then we can uh, push this to our uh, control crowd communities to actually uh, deliver the target uh, data in uh, low resource languages so this is quite good solution for uh, uh, low resource languages and we see it as, as a very popular and also very cost efficient comparing to actual uh, translations or uh, comparing to uh, data position in, in uh, low resource languages. Great. Uh, question for Jörn. Uh, how does LILT integrate new human translation into your adaptive MT? Is it through frequent retraining? Um, this is through uh, the, the, the adaptive feedback loop. Uh, actually means that for every user, we store a user-specific um, model, and this this user-specific model 
uh, is updated after every single uh, sentence that is being translated. So there is basically an update happening whenever someone hits the confirm button after having translated uh, a sentence, and that means for the next sentence, um, yeah, this this uh, the system already has learned from from the sentence before that. Thanks. Um, there's only one question left and we still have some minutes. So, you know, we have all these experts here on the stage now. If you have a question, a burning question, type them in and we can uh, uh, talk about it now. Uh, as I'm speaking, there's new questions popping up, so that's good. Um, do you have any tools to suggest for anon anonymization processes? Um, we talked about that a little bit in last month's webinar. I don't know, David, if you can uh, expand on that a little bit. Yeah, well, so um, this is this is still under development, right? Uh, so part of part of the data um, marketplace, one of the tools that we we will having in the data marketplace is the anonymization process. So. Uh, we come up with uh, with um, a few algorithms that will recognize these patterns that that personal uh, personal information is identified. So like names, uh, numbers that could be um, that could be uh, you know credit card numbers or uh, uh, postal codes, etc. Uh, so that is that will be recognized from these uh, from data that will be uh, added to the data marketplace, and uh, this is also part of the part of the cleaning of of, of those data. Um, the point is that uh, these these segments where this personal information is uh, is identified uh, can be excluded from uh, from publication. So that is uh, that's one of the tools that we will be having for uh, anonymization of uh, of language data um, to be uh, continued very soon. Thanks. Uh, one final question, JP, for you, uh, and I hope you can have a quick answer, uh, one minute answer. How do you define human in the loop uh, at Sustran? Is it uh, adopting or adapting translator feedback in real time? Yeah, so there's been a, there's a, yeah, there's a few ways, and I'll try to be very quick about it. So one way, of course, is taking post-edited material and feeding it back to Sustran for uh, uh, a customization retraining cycle. The newest that we've added is what we call a uh, neural fuzzy adaptation, which takes uh, translation memory or post-edited material and feeds it back for real-time machine translation use. So the, the confirmed sentence can be used at the very next translation by, uh, by the system for either additional human-in-the-loop interaction or for raw machine translation output. Great, thank you so much. And yeah, with that, we only have one minute left and I just wanted to um, give you a quick sneak peek of our next month's webinar. Um, you know, on 22 April, we will be discussing the community approach to data and AI. Uh, of course, this whole AI revolution has also um, paved the way for this invisible workforce, the community, the crowd workers, uh, who are now helping us uh, to train technology and get get make the technology get smarter. So next month we'll be uh, talking more about this and we'll also be hearing from a few of these people in this invisible workforce. So um, I hope to in invite you again next month. And for now, thank you so much, Jörn, JP, Miroš and David for your presentations today. Uh, if you have any other questions after this, I think both Jorin and JP shared their contact de details and you can write to Taos and we'd be happy to discuss uh, uh, separately. So enjoy your day uh, or evening and um, see you next month. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.